if you're able to, please remain standing for the reading of God's word. We're reading John 6, 1 through 15. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about five thousand in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is the word of the Lord. All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If you are online, then welcome to our online uh, worship gathering. If you're here in person, then we're glad that you're here as well. Uh, this morning, we are going to be in John chapter 6 in the passage that Jenny just read. And um, it's a great passage. If you're online, then let us know that you're there. It'd be great to know where you're from. And uh, if you have any prayer requests, then let us know. And so this morning in John 6, the title of the message is Bread Giver or King? Bread Giver or King? So let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word. Uh, today, we open it up and we ask that your Holy Spirit would help us to understand, help us to receive it. God, we come with so many different, um, so many different thoughts during this past week. Lord, whether they're burdens we're carrying or things that we're excited about or wanting to know your direction or for some people just wanting to know who you are. So God, I pray that you would meet us right where we are and that you would speak to us. And God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would lead us unto all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Um, you know, I was thinking about this, uh, this, this week that we have this narrow gate uh, narrow is the gate, and, and the way is hard that leads to life. And there are those who find it are few. And it seems like in our world today that there's this kind of philosophy that uh, it's a broad way. Any way that you want to, you're going to end up at God. And however you want to seek him, whatever you want to do, it's all going to end up in the same place. And really, that is so contradictory to the way of Jesus, who teaches that the gate is narrow, the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So I, I've been thinking about how we live in a culture right now where there are so many different things that are competing, voices that are competing for our, our souls, for our attention, for worship. And um, I'm, I'm blessed that in the midst of uh, Santa Cruz County, which uh, is a, a spiritual but not religious county, it's a county where it's kind of like, hey, do whatever you want to do, and it'll go, you know, like, uh, whatever you want to think, that's your own spirituality, and you could kind of create the God that you want. 
Uh, just recently, there was something called the Regeneration Project. I'm glad that it's called that. Uh, they were meeting over at, at uh, Westgate in Saratoga, and uh, Daniel went on Friday night. And it, uh, the, it was, is reading the Bible the fastest way to lose your faith? What they had there is they had two people in a debate, and uh, it was an atheist who was a Christian that became an atheist by reading the Bible, got confused over many things that this person read. He, he realized that in church, they wouldn't really cover these things. They really didn't cover a lot of the Bible. So, so then when he started reading the Bible for himself, he started feeling like, wow, this is kind of crazy. But then uh, he was debating a woman who was an atheist. And she became a Christian because she read the Bible. And as she kept reading the Bible and studying scripture and seeing are these things true, she became a follower of Jesus. And so I'm thankful for this dialogue between this atheist and Christian. And, you know, Daniel was telling me it really helped strengthen his faith. You know, people ask these questions, isn't the Bible pro-slavery and violence and uh, misogyny and anti-science? And I think that what you'll see at times is that people read the Bible in ways that are not helpful because they're just looking for parts, just little parts here and there and how they could make an amalgamation of what they want to believe. Uh, This Saturday at Twin Lakes Church, there is a a conference called uh, the Bible Conference, and there are some speakers. uh, Gary Brashears, who is my professor at Western, is going to be there. Um, They're going to talk about a lot of different uh, topics, so you could sign up online. That is coming on Saturday. And I, I, I was thinking about this. I was talking to someone recently. For every mile of road, if the way is narrow, as Jesus says, for every mile of road, this is not a Bible verse, by the way. This is just a, a proverb that is really cool and very true. For every mile of road, there is two miles of ditch. Okay, for every road, there's two miles of ditch. And I think as a Christian, following the way of Jesus, what are some of the ditches that we could fall into on either side of things? Sometimes I think about um, the ditches. Am I, am I behind on this? There it is. Um, there are political ditches. You know, sometimes it's like, hey, uh, we're, we're, we're going to follow this way or that way, and it's all about politics. Sometimes it's the ditch of all about head knowledge and growing in knowledge, but not the heart. Sometimes it's the ditch of emotionalism without being theologically and biblically grounded. See, we don't do well with balance as human beings. You ever notice that, how the pendulum just kind of swings from one side or the other? Very seldom, the way of Jesus, which is this narrow road, um, and we need the Holy Spirit to help us and the word of God to guide us. Otherwise, we get one way or another way. So what we're doing, uh, one of the things that we're doing is we're doing these these learning labs. And a learning lab, uh, this one is called Theology and Life. I know I've shared it before, but it, it, it's so important because learning labs provide a community of Jesus followers. We could talk about things. We're gonna learn how to talk about things where there may be confusion and ask questions. And it's not like my way or the highway, but it, it's really a curiosity and with Bibles open and hearts open, looking to scripture. It's a theological lens instead of a cultural lens or a political lens or even a personal lens. It's a way of looking at things through scripture rather than just my own personal opinion. And then it also um, evokes curiosity and questions. And then finally, with loving shepherds to help us along the way. Sometimes people say, well, my church is just, you know, me and uh, two buddies, two friends, and we hang out. That's church. But is there any authority? Is there any uh, pastoral leadership? Is there any wisdom from that? So if I disagree with my buddy, then is is it just, well, your opinion is the same as my opinion? Because in scripture, we see this pillar and foundation of the church, uh, the foundation that the apostles had laid that God gives to us. And that's what we hope to do in learning labs. There are times where we are going to ask questions of, you know, week one is, Um, In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, there's diversity. And in all things, there's charity. But what are the essentials? And what makes something an essential? And if there's a non-essential, is it still important? And if it's important, how can we talk about it? What about eschatology, end times? What about the way that the Holy Spirit works in the life of believers? So we are going to look at some of those. 
We're going to look at how to form a theology and then how to apply these things to our lives. And so I just wanted to encourage you to sign up for that because space is limited. And because of that, we will put some of these online. But um, in seminary, I was able to be a part of a pastoral cohort of about 40, you know, 35 to 40 of us in a room with professors at tables talking about things. There were some times where I couldn't make it and I had to do Zoom. And it, it's a big difference because you're not asking the questions and looking at the people right next to you. And, and, and it's, it's great as an alternative, but if you could be here in person, I would suggest that. So this morning in the book of John, chapter six, one through 15, bread giver or king. Do you remember in the book of John, we've been looking at how there are these seven signs that John points out. Other signs that Jesus did that are not included in this book, but the ones that are included are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the, the son of God and that believing you might have life in his name. So Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the son of God. And that believing uh, you might have life in his name. And we have looked at already Jesus turning water to wine. We have looked, in, looked at him healing the nobleman's son, healing the man at the pool of uh, Bethesda, which we are just in the tail end of. And now in this chapter, we are going to see this miraculous feeding that occurs. This miracle, this sign is in all of the gospels. Other than the resurrection of Jesus, it's the only miracle that is in all of these gospels. So there is something about this miracle in particular, this sign in particular, that is very, very important for us to get. So the outline is we're following the signs. Uh, Jesus sees the need. Our solutions and his provision. Do you ever have solutions to things in your life? And then God says, I, no, I have a different solution for you. Um, we are going to see what kind of king people are looking for. And then we're going to ask this question, is he simply a bread giver or is he really king? Uh, it's really cool that we're looking at this passage in light of being yesterday was the coronation of King Charles III. Did any of you hear about that? It's the king of England. Uh, they haven't had a king. I think it's in like 60, 60 years or something. So the coronation of the king of England, we will we'll look at that in, in a, a little bit as well. But turn to John chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. It says, after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. So Tiberius Caesar, the Sea of Galilee, for a while gets named after him. Um, if you ever go to Galilee, if you go to Galilee with us, it is... Uh, when I used to think of Israel, I used to think of Israel as just sand and rocks and dryness. Galilee's this beautiful Mediterranean climate. It is gorgeous. There's like, if you go in the spring, flowers are blooming. You could, you could take a little cruise out on the Sea of Galilee, uh, which we'll do. And uh, they, they gave us a net. They said, here, why don't you try to cast this net, see if you can catch any fish. Like Peter, we caught nothing. Um, but, but they do sometimes catch uh, there. The Sea of Galilee is um, just imagine like a mini Lake Tahoe. It, it's not the ocean. It's really a lake. And uh, Jesus is with the disciples and they're going over to one of the sides, the other side of the Sea of Galilee. But from the size of this lake, you could actually see, okay, where's he going? And just imagine like paparazzi. Like they're following him around. There he is, there he is. Okay, he's over there. And then they, they run around the lake. They get to that place waiting for Jesus and the disciples to get there. And this large crowd is following him because they saw signs that he was doing on the sick. So he was healing people. And they're saying, wow, look at what he's doing and, and let's follow him. And, and they, they want to see Jesus, this healer. And, and that's understandable. I don't fault them for that. They wanted to find out who he was. They, they saw some of the miracles, some of the things that he had done. And um, Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat down with his disciples. But again, they could see where he was. So they follow him. They get there, this large crowd. And the Passover, the feast of the Jews was at hand. So this is um, either previous to or just after this Passover feast. And Jesus is there. And then it goes on uh, to say... 
that lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Now, uh, according to other sources, this uh, was likely Philip's hometown. Okay, Philip is from this area. So Philip, you know the stores. Like, where do we get bread for all of these people? So imagine if there are, there, there's this incredible multitude of people, this large crowd. And I love this. It, it's a simple phrase that says, Jesus lifting up his eyes. He lifted up his eyes and he saw. You know, at times in scripture, it says that Jesus saw the crowds as sheep without a shepherd. So too often when I see a crowd, all I see is a crowd. When I see a line, all I see is a line. We're, we're going to have bread today. We are going to not only have communion, but there's an agape feast, a, a place for you to eat and hang out, and there's a line. And you're gonna see a line of people. Instead of seeing people as just, oh, there's a long line, Jesus sees people and he sees their need. Uh, I, I started to pray when, when I was down in LA, I used to teach and uh, the, the traffic there, I mean, we have traffic on highway one here, right? If you get to the fish hook at like three o'clock in the afternoon, forget it, right? You're going towards Watsonville. And, and sometimes I still get frust frustrated with that, but that is nothing like the traffic in LA on 405 freeway or 57 freeway and you're just sitting there and you just see this massive group of people in traffic. And I remember when I was uh, seeing people in traffic, I started to pray, God, help me to see people as sheep without a shepherd. So I'm, I'm driving past people and I'm wondering what they're going through. And I'm, I'm looking at them, I'm trying to have that attitude. I, I will admit that that didn't always work. Uh, there was this one time when I was sitting in traffic I mean, it wasn't stop and go traffic. It was just stop traffic. Nobody's moving. And I'm in the right-hand lane, and, and my exit is just a couple of miles down the road. And I look in my mirror, I see this car pull out on the shoulder of the road and just pass me. And of course, after that car does that, what does every car do? I see all of these cars. And they just all get out, and they just start passing. And, and I'm getting frustrated because I'm, I'm waiting in line. I'm doing things the right way. This is how you're supposed to be. And everyone is passing me, and I'm thinking, well, should I go there? I don't want to get a ticket. I shouldn't do that. But I don't want these people to get ahead of me. So what I do with my car is I pull out my car halfway into my lane and halfway into that lane. That's just the kind of person I am. And then I start to see these cars pile up behind me and I look and then they're honking and they're yelling and the people on this side are cheering and they're honking. And I'm like, yeah, I stopped this traffic. I stopped them. So I, I definitely was not seeing them as sheep at a shepherd. But Jesus sees a large crowd and he thinks about them being hungry. He, he actually thinks about their needs. But then he asks Philip, hey, Philip, I love how Jesus says, he asked this question, we. Hey, where are we? Where are we going to buy bread? And sometimes God will show you a need. And, and when he shows me a need, sometimes I just think it's all on me. How can I meet this need? How can I do this? And, and I forget that Jesus, when he shows us a need, that he wants us to do something about, it's a we. Amen. What are we going to do about this? Because me plus God is like, that's a majority, right? Me plus God, I have, I have some provision and some help and some strength. But he says, where are we to buy bread so these people may eat? But notice that when Jesus said this, Jesus himself knew what he would do. Sometimes when God shows you a problem or a dilemma or some area where there's a need, he already knows what he's gonna do. I don't know but he knows. And sometimes in my prayers, I start to panic as though he doesn't know. Um, sometimes when people panic over things that are no big deal, I, I get impatient when people are freaked out about things. Uh, when Rebecca, our oldest daughter, when she was a, a kid, um, we were in our front yard and uh, we, the, the sprinklers, you know, were uh, the runoff from the grass was along the sidewalk. And there was maybe a foot, a foot of water, maybe, maybe two feet. And she was probably four years old or something. And we were walking on the sidewalk and she says, dad, come get me. And I said, no, jump over that. And she goes, 
no, if I jump over it, I'll slip. And I go, you won't slip. It's okay, just jump over it. I was just, just trying to teach her to just jump over this little puddle of water. And she says, I'm going to slip. I said, you're not gonna slip, you're gonna be fine. And then she goes, if I jump, will you catch me? I go, sure. But when she jumps, instead of looking at me, she looks down at the ground. If you're a, a long jump coach, like I was, you know that where your eyes go, your body goes. And she looks down and she hits the end of the water and she slips and she falls down. And she goes, see, I told you, I told you I was gonna slip. <laughs> so then I, I pick her up. And, and sometimes in her panic of things, um, I would feel, I would wanna be the calm one. Like if, if I'm calm, then she should be okay. But there are times when in my panic, I pray these prayers that are so panicked as though God is panicking. Like, God, what are we gonna do about this? And I kind of freak out about things, like look at this situation that I'm going through. What, what, what's gonna happen? Or if you're praying for someone and you're, you're, you're bringing that need before the Lord, which is a real need, there are too many times that I pray to God as though he is also confused as though he also doesn't have enough money or enough strength or enough help or enough comfort. So Jesus knew what he was going to do. And then uh, Philip answered, he said, well, at, at least he gave an answer. He said, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each one of them even to get a little. Um, a denarii would be a day's wages. E even if we had 200 days wages, it's not enough money to feed all of these people this great multitude. So he, he brings this need to Jesus. He gives his solution. He's like, we don't even have enough money. But then one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother said to him, well, there's a boy who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Sometimes in the provision that God gives, I, I compare using um, my own worldly, my own human uh, mathematics. Like what is, what is my ability amongst so many needs? What are our, our ability? Sometimes I think about Santa Cruz County and I think about um, reaching people in this county and I think about even the churches when we're gathered together, so few compared to so many. But I think that when we do that, Again, we're calculating based on self. And I don't blame Philip and Andrew. I mean, he at least brings the solution. He says, what are they for so many? So this boy is here. He has five barley loaves and two fish. He must have been a boy scout. Uh, he is uh, always prepared. You know, he's the one that, that brings some food, some provision for the day. And then um, Jesus does something. It says that Jesus said, have the people sit down. So they're trying to calm everyone down. Uh, if you've seen this depicted in The Chosen, this is such a cool, such a cool scene. Uh, in fact, uh, Dave and Edie were actually in this scene. So uh, you, could, you could find them. They're in the credits. If you watch the credits at the end, it says starring Dave and Edie Boshin, which is very cool. Um, so the people sit down and, and there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down about 5,000 in number. If there's 5,000 men, probably at least 15,000 people. Uh, Scotts Valley is like 12,000 people. So feeding a city of people that are following him. And, and uh, this is an area called the Decapolis, which means like 10 cities. And all these cities, they gather together. The rumor mill, no social media. They're not, they're not doing geolocation <laughs> tagging. It's just they're, they're telling people, Jesus is here. Word gets out and they all come to see him. They follow him and they're all there you know, and 5,000 in number of men, so maybe 15, 20,000 people. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. I've read this story too many times sometimes where it could lose some of the power of it unless I pray that God gives me that sanctified imagination. But what did this look like? Like, I, I don't understand what this looks like. And that's what I love to, I, I try to picture it in my mind. Is, is it like every time he, he tears the bread that it grows and then he tears more bread 
is it that the loaves just start to multiply in the back? It, it's, he takes them, and when he gives thanks, this happens. I, I think about Jesus giving thanks. As he gives thanks here, uh, the, the traditional Jewish prayer, blessed are you, Lord God, king of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Except now it's not coming from the earth. It's coming from this bread giver, Jesus himself, the bread of life. He's multiplying it somehow and with the fish. And I, I, I just, man, I, I wish I had a replay button and I could see what this looks like. But just imagine the joy and the laughter. This is a verse. Verse 11 is one verse. It says, he took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish as much as they wanted. It's one verse that doesn't describe the whole scene of them just, I, I mean, I just I would have just been dumbfounded. My eyes light up like, yes, look, look, it's, it's growing. Like, like, look at this. And every time I, I give, I look in the basket or, or is it that as, as he's tearing it and he's giving thanks that it's, it's, again, how is that multiplication happening? I don't know. But I, I do know that they ate as much as they wanted. Um, there have been times that I've been at an all-you-can-eat buffet and they said, that's all you can eat. And I'm like, no, it's all like, they said, yeah, we're telling you, that's all you can, you're done. Like, because my brother and I would go and like, we would get whatever, like, usually it's the meat or the stuff that's very expensive. We just keep, we would just like sit around, almost sometimes just sitting, wait till they cut it and then like eat it and then like just grab it again. Um, but they ate as much as they wanted. I just think about the joy in this, that his provision is enough. It's always enough. Jesus' provision for you is enough. So this morning, I'm thinking, what is the need that you have? Maybe it's an emotional need. And you're thinking, there's deficit here because someone that I love isn't loving me back. Or I don't have that friendship that I want to have. Or I, I have this need to, to reconcile with someone that I am not walking closely with. And whatever that need is, know that Jesus can fill the provision for that need. Sometimes it's a financial need and we're thinking I don't have enough, but maybe it, it could be that he provides in ways that you haven't even thought of. It could also be that sometimes what I think I need, God has another plan. I just know that they ate as much as they wanted and then not only had they eaten their fill, but notice what it says. When they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. That nothing may be lost. Man, I miss, I really miss my mom. Uh, we, we used to go to, and do any of you remember a place called Hometown Buffet? Okay, <laughs> Hometown Buffet, where it was her favorite place to go because it's smorgasbord, it was all you could eat. And it was really funny because like, we would be eating as much as we could and we're eating and, and then I would look and my mom is stuffing cookies in her purse. <laughs> she's wrapping them up in napkins and <laughs> she's like putting the, the cookies in her purse. It was great. I'm like, mom, what are you doing? She's like, oh, shh. And, and that's so unlike her, but like she would go to all you could eat and, and she wanted the fragments that remain. Hey, hey these are going to be lost. They're on my plate. They're going to throw them away anyway, right? So if they're going to throw them away, we might as well take them. And so I, I, I look at Jesus, the disciples who are thinking, we don't have enough money. We have five barley loaves from this boy and, and you know, a couple of fish, and that's not enough. We have like some bagels and fish sticks. <laughs> like, like here, here's my lunch bag. I'll share it with you guys. And, uh, and, and yet, what, what do they do? Jesus says, gather the leftover fragments and they gathered them up, and what did they fill? 12 baskets. There are 12 apostles, and every single one of them has a basket. Jesus always has enough, but not just enough. Sometimes we, we sing that song, Your Grace is Enough. Have you guys remember that song, Your Grace is Enough? And, and yet, the word enough, it doesn't uh, convey abundance. Jesus' grace is way more than just enough. It's abundant. He blesses me not only with my needs, but there are times when I'm just like blown away at God's provision, at his blessings, him taking care of us, him giving more than we need. And I'm just going like, I, I don't, 
sometimes we ask this question, why me? And sometimes that's the question that keeps people from really following Jesus. They get a flat tire on the way to a job interview. They're on the side of the freeway and like, I was going to, and God, why me? But do we say, God, why me when God blesses us? So sometimes when God blesses me, I'm like, God, why me? Like, I don't even, I don't deserve this. God, why me? Like, you're blessing me so much that I don't deserve, and I know I don't deserve this. And I think that that should be the, the why me that we ask. Like, God, why me? Like, you chose me, you saved me, you've forgiven me, then you bless me and you take care of me. And even if you're going through hard times, I'm not doubting that you're going through difficulties or that the pain and the trauma maybe that you've been through is real. But you listening to this message is also God telling you that he loves you and he's taking care of you. He's reminding you of something today. Us being here, us having the word of God, us having a place to go, having the ability to watch online, all of these things are God's provision. And sometimes I miss God's provision because my focus is on my lack. I miss God's provision because I am looking at the wrong thing sometimes. And I'm measuring whether or not God loves me because of this thing that I'm lacking rather than saying I'm looking to the cross that Jesus died for my sins. I'm looking at his blessings in my life. I'm looking at him taking care of me. They gathered them up, the 12 uh, baskets with the fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. Um, I, I, I think that that's really cool also because sometimes when I'm at a restaurant and I look at what people don't eat, I want to ask them, are you going to eat that? Like, <laughs> you're, you haven't touched that and that you haven't even, and like, that's, that's still good. Uh, if you work food service, I used to work at a, a nice restaurant called the Velvet Turtle and I, I hated if I didn't have a chance to eat before my shift because I am taking the, the food out to them and I'm looking at it. Then when I'm taking the food out to the back, I'm looking at it thinking like, I should just eat all this food right now. It looks, looks so good. But they were able to do that. They, they gathered the fragments, the fragments, uh, those who had eaten. And then it goes on and it says this. When the people saw the sign that he had done, so they, they saw this, not only had some of them seen the man healed at the pool of um, Bethsaida, but... Bethesda, but then also, you know, maybe they had heard about the nobleman's son being healed, or maybe they had heard about the water being turned to wine. But this miracle, um, John chapter six is a turning point in the gospel of John. As we go through John six, this is a, a long chapter, over 70 verses. So that's why we're breaking this chapter up. But chapter six is a turning point because in chapter six, you're gonna see the height of Jesus's popularity and by the end of the chapter, you're going to see very quickly that he begins to lose his following because of the hard words that he says to them. See, at this point in time, they're looking at the signs, this specific sign, and then they said, this indeed is the prophet who has come into the world. In the book of Deuteronomy, uh, Moses said, for, God will, um, for there will arise a prophet like me. So in the same way that there's a prophet like Moses. What did Moses do for them, the Israelites, when they're going through the, the wilderness? One of the things is manna from heaven, bread, or whatever this manna, this substance is like. It just, it falls from the sky and they're able to eat. And they're like, this is him. This is the one we've been looking for. He's that prophet, the one that we've been waiting for. You know, like, like Moses, and then it says in verse 15, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. They're going to take him. These words shouldn't go together. A, a, a king, and then they were going to take him by force to make him king. To me, that doesn't sound like a very powerful king when the people are making him do what they want him to do. We are going to take him by force and we are going to make him by king and Jesus will have none of it. He came, Jesus is king. He's king of the universe. But when they try to force him to, to make him the king, he withdraws again to the mountain by himself. Uh, there was a, 
there was a, a Roman named Juvenal. I don't know where, if, if that's where we get juvenile delinquent, but <laughs> Juvenal was his name. And he has that famous saying, give them bread and circuses and they will never revolt. So when the Romans start to take over, they have the gladiator wars. Entertain them. Give them something to focus on. And by the way, entertainment, we have to be careful. Um, God gives us gifts of music and art and, and, and story and all of these things, but entertainment can often be a way to numb us to our real need. It could be a way to drown out our sorrows. It, it could become escapism. It could be a way to, like an ostrich, bury our head in the sand and not worry about any of the problems that are going on around us because it's just easier to entertain ourselves. And then if you give them bread, he said, if you provide physically for them, that you give them tax refunds or uh, credits or uh, stimulus packages, entertain them, they're not really gonna think about the real needs that are there. They're not gonna think about what is really going on is what Juvenal said. And this is true of Rome and it's true in modern cultures as well today. Give them bread and circuses and Jesus will not be manipulated. He will not become what I see at times we see him as, like a vending machine. If I put my coins in, then I hit the right button, then I'm gonna get what I want. So if I go to church and I read my Bible once in a while and I pray, then what I want, I'm supposed to get. Have you ever, I was gonna say, have you ever seen someone, but I'm gonna make it more personal. Have you ever not gotten what you wanted from a vending machine? And when you did not get what you want, and you don't have to raise your hand, did you just freak out? Did you start kicking that thing or yelling at it or starting, you're telling everyone about it. They're walking by, can you believe this machine? Look at, I ordered this, I didn't get this. And like, I'm trying to get, and it, it's like, it's hanging on right there and you could see it and it's like stuck. And you, can you help me tilt this thing over? And man, I've seen people go ballistic on vending machines because the vending machine doesn't give what they wanted to give. I put in what I'm supposed to put in. This is what I'm supposed to get out. Sometimes people, sometimes we can treat God like that. And we could say, I put in what I'm supposed to put in. God, I'm not getting out what I'm supposed to get out. And when I don't get what I think that I should get, I could freak out and say, God, you don't love me. You don't care about me. You don't see my need. Uh, God, don't you see this isn't fair. This isn't fair. I'm so thankful that God doesn't give me what's fair. Remember that in Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, it says, he who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's not fair. And I'm super glad that it's not fair because in God's grace, it's more than enough. He's a God of super abundance, above and beyond beyond all that we could ask or think, like he provides for us, he takes care of us, he loves us. And if I only see him as a vending machine, then you know what kind of king he becomes for me? He becomes, for me, a puppet king. And a puppet king is a king that is only king in name, but not king in deed. A puppet king is a king that you could prop up and you could pull the strings and you, you can make that puppet king do what you want him to do. And when you think about these puppet kings, politically, at times, there are puppet kings. They could be puppet governors or puppet mayors or puppet, puppet presidents. Um, I've even seen that happen in, in churches. R right now, I'm reading um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's biography by Eric Metaxas. And in the church in Germany, there were puppet pastors that the Nazis were getting them to do, that Hitler was getting them to do whatever he wanted them to do. And they had name pastor, but they had no power, no authority, and they didn't root their authority in scripture. And so what I see is these puppet kings. Now, I'm not saying that yesterday's <laughs> coronation of King Charles III is necessarily puppet king, but I am saying this, 
the king of England doesn't have power like the king of England used to have power. There is a whole lot of pomp and circumstance. It's a lot of ceremony, but you have this parliament and you have a prime minister that really has more political power than the king. And this king, it, 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 it's crazy to me. As the world uh, watched yesterday, um, I, I was reading about how many heads of state were there. Uh, like uh, the first lady was there and, and there were presidents, you know, the president of France, different people were there. They were invited into this exclusive, um, you know, coronation of King Charles. And, and another thing about King Charles, uh, he had said earlier years ago that instead, because the King of England, I don't know if you know this, uh, one of his titles is the defender of the faith of Christianity, upholding the gospel of Jesus Christ. And years ago, he had said that he wanted to possibly change that to become the defender of the faiths with an S, adding one letter behind it. Now, should we um, have this care and concern that everybody has um, a right? Absolutely, everyone could believe what they want to believe. That's where autonomy comes from. God even gives that to us. But as the defender of the faith, it was this representation of the gospel. And um, it, it seems like that's being challenged right now in, in England. And yet the whole world, I think every king points to the true king. Every lesser king, all of the glory of a, a, like a coronation parade, almost like an inauguration parade down the streets of Washington, D.C., uh, all of the sense of honor, all of the sense of royalty, all of that just points to Jesus. It all points to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. But our, 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 king, is, our king is different. When we think about our king, he's a king that is not a puppet king that can be manipulated. Again, I'm gonna have to quote from C.S. Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia. Aslan is seen as a, a symbol of Jesus. Some people see Jesus not as king of kings, like a king, like a lion, king of the jungle, but more like uh, when I was the principal of Calvary Chapel Academy in San Jose, our mascot was the lion of the tribe of Judah. So we were the Calvary Chapel lions. Sometimes a lion can just be a mascot. And what is a mascot? A mascot represents you. You like to be associated with a mascot, but the mascot is not your king. Sometimes Christians see Jesus as my mascot. He's my mascot. He, he represents me, I represent him. I'm associated with him, but not king. C.S. Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia in uh, the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, there's a part where... Um, there's a, a, a human, her name is Susan, and they call her a daughter of Eve, and she's learning about who Aslan is. She wants to find out who Aslan is. And Mr. Beaver, who is one of the characters in the Chronicles of Narnia, tells Susan that Aslan, the ruler of Narnia, is this great lion. And Susan is freaked out, a lion? I'm afraid of lions. And so she begins to ask this question. Since she assumed that Aslan was a man, and when she finds out that he is a lion, she tells Mr. Beaver, Susan says, I shall rather feel very nervous about meeting a lion. So she asks Mr. Beaver if Aslan is safe. Do you guys know this line? Is Aslan safe? To which Mr. Beaver replies, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king. See, I love that, because sometimes we want Jesus to be so safe that he's never going to call us to do something that is really hard. Um, when Bonhoeffer is challenging the pastors in Germany at the rise of Nazism, the rise of Hitler, he, at a pastor's conference, teaches from the book of Jeremiah. And as he's teaching from the book of Jeremiah, he says Jeremiah was God's prisoner. There were times that Jeremiah didn't want to do what God told him to do. And it says that when he held it in, the message that God gave to Jeremiah, which was repentance and turn towards God, when he held it in, he said, it was like fire that it was shut up in my bones. And I was weary from holding it in. I, I had to do what God had called me to do. Paul says the love of Christ compels us or constrains us. 
God doesn't call us to easy lives. He hasn't promised that to follow him, everything is gonna work out. The arrow goes up and to the right. He doesn't promise it all goes up and to the right. He doesn't promise us that you're gonna get the job and you're gonna get the person that you, you want to marry and everything is gonna work out in your life. See, when we follow Jesus, at times it's not safe. It wasn't safe for Paul the Apostle. In fact, Paul the Apostle, who preached the gospel, ended up being beheaded. Peter, who followed Jesus, ended up being crucified upside down. I, I could think of more modern people like uh, Jim Elliott, who, who went to Ecuador to reach a, a, a people that had never heard of Jesus, and he gets killed along with Nate Saint and the other missionaries that are there. Some of you are gonna get fired from jobs, possibly, because you're a follower of Jesus. Some of you will be canceled. Some of you will have friends that will pull away. Some of you won't get the position that you want. Do you realize that in the culture that we live in today, that when someone is put up for office or a judgeship or something, sometimes they wanna find out, oh, this person is a Christian and look at their background, look at what Christians believe. And they're almost saying you have to, and in Germany, this is what they did. They had to disavow. The cross was replaced by the swastika. That was a mandate. And some pastors went along with it. And they said, oh, this is one of those things where we could agree to disagree and we could all be in unity and harmony. The road to follow Jesus is very narrow and there are ditches on both sides. And sometimes the ditch is we are against everyone. That's a ditch. If, if we follow Jesus as angry people that are against the world, we're in the wrong ditch. We're, we're in, a, in a ditch, we're not following the way. If we follow Jesus and say, okay, I'm following Jesus, but whatever you believe, all roads lead to God and whatever you wanna do is fine and we could just, we're on the same path, then that's a ditch. See, to follow Jesus is, the, is to follow the king. Now in a moment, we are going to partake of communion, which is called the Lord's Supper. The king that we have invites us to his table. I was reading about how many people were invited to the actual coronation, which was a, a small group. Many people were there, but, but a smaller group was at uh, the Abbey, um, um, Westminster Abbey, where the, the king is coronated. And, and he still said, I, I believe he still said, defender of the faith. And I believe that he still talked about the gospel of Jesus Christ, because Marcus Welby, not Marcus, uh, Justin Welby. Marcus Welby was a doctor on a TV show. <laughs> Uh, Justin, Justin Welby is the, the head, of the bishop of the Anglican Church or the, the Church of England at the time. So he says, defend the gospel. Um, but in that, in that coronation, I'm not invited. I, I'm not at that table. Only the exclusive, very powerful, very wealthy, very prestigious people are invited to that table. But at Jesus' table, we're all invited and we were invited to come as we are. We're invited to come with our brokenness. We're invited to come with, what kind of a bad week did I have last week? You're still invited. What kind of a bad day did I have yesterday? How did I mess up so much and I just feel this weight or I just don't feel the faith or I don't feel loved or I, whatever that might be, come to the table. But as we partake with the king, I think it's important that we don't see him as the vending machine. Jesus is not the puppet king. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords that invites us. So we're gonna show uh, the way that we are going to partake of communion. We're gonna show this quick uh, video and we're just gonna consider. And I would just ask that you pray during this video that the Holy Spirit reminds you of who Jesus is as king of kings. And then hold on to the elements and we are going to partake together at the same time afterward. And so we're gonna show this video. He's a king of the Jews, that's a racial king. He's a king of Israel, that's a national king. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings, and he is a lord of lords. Now that's my king. Well, I wonder if you know him. Do you know him? Don't try to mislead me. Do you know my king? David 
said the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. My king is the only one whom there no means of measure can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supplies. No barriers can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. Well, well, he's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's impurely powerful. He's impartially merciful. That's my king. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands alone in himself. He's august. He's unique. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's supreme. He's preeminent. Well, he's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the supreme problem in high criticism. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the cardinal necessity of spiritual religion. And that's my king. He's the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. Well, he, he's the only one able to supply all of our needs simultaneously. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He star guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. Do you know him? Well, my king is a key of knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. He's a master of the mighty. He's a captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislators. He's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the governor of governors. He's a prince of princes. He's the king of kings. And he's the lord of lords. That's my king. Yeah. Yeah. That's my king. My king. Yeah. His office is manifold. His promise is sure. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Well, I wish I could describe him to you. But he Comprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. I'm trying to tell you, the heavens of heavens cannot contain him, let alone a man explaining him. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king. Yeah! He always has been. And he always will be. I'm talking about he had no predecessor. And he'll have no successor. There was nobody before him, and there'll be nobody after him. You can't impeach him, and he's not going to resign. That's my Praise the Lord. That's my Time. Time is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Well, all the power 
belongs to my king. We around here talking about black power and white power and green power, but it's God's power. Thine is the power. Yeah. And the glory. We try to get prestige and honor and glory for ourselves, but the glory is all his. Yes, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. How long is that? And ever and ever and ever and ever. And will you get through with all of the forever? Then amen. Yeah.